Before the coming of plant life, the glaciers left behind bare ground. But it was quickly invaded by mosses, algae and lichens, which, since they do not have roots, were able to colonize the bare rock. Lichens are the real pioneers. These self-sufficient little organisms, a kind of micro-ecosystem in themselves, can live on nutrients in the air that surrounds them, the waters that wash over them, and even absorb minerals from the very rocks on which they grow. As this minute vegetation decomposed, organic soil was formed, and in this welcoming environment the first plants put down roots. On an exposed hillside, say at the edge of a road, where the gravel and sand and things like that are kind of un unvegetated, you can get a good idea of the process of recolonization. And it all starts off with the tiniest of organisms, things like soil algae and lichens. And we can look down and take a close look at some of these. They actually start to form a crust over the surface. And you can see the greens in there uh, where the algae is growing along with the rest of the, the lichens. You can even see some tiny mosses starting up. Eventually these will coalesce and form a continuous layer and it will provide a good seed bed for other plants. Moisture and a little sunlight is all it takes to keep lichen in business. The formula is simple. Water, solar energy and carbon dioxide make starch and oxygen. However, these tiny, colorful and odd-shaped generators of life also absorb pollutants and radioactivity. Like litmus paper, they are an environmental warning system. At the base of this dead balsam poplar we see covered with moss, more, more or less on the north side of the tree, and some small reproductive structures growing up from the mosses here, these right there and there. And then intermingled is a little bit of the bracket fungi all through here. And I notice a couple of places where it looks like the tops of that bracket fungi has been colonized by some algae. So it's given a bit of that green color. The fungi itself is, doesn't have any chlorophyll, so it doesn't photosynthesize, but the algae grows on top and around it. These bracket fungi will be decomposing the, the tree. Fungi have various different ecological roles, and you're less likely to find as many of these on some of the living trees. But many of these plants, you see, it's middle of winter, but they're still green. And uh, in addition to the evergreen needles on the spruce and pine trees, you see this kind of situation where there's wintergreen and other vascular plants, but also the mosses, which retain their chlorophyll. This gives them a competitive advantage. So any day that the temperature does increase and there's sunlight, there's a better chance that they'll be able to start photosynthesizing. And that's a big advantage of a lot of northern plants, is evergreenness, to take advantage of the short growing season. Okay, so the boreal forest is an evergreen forest, but much of that evergreenness is actually beneath the snow. And if you dig down and take a close look, you can find some examples of that. And I'm just going to move the snow away here, and what have I got? A little bit of some feather mosses of some kind there, a little bit of emerald green. What else? I see some pyrola or some winter green itself, some maybe a pink winter green leaves a bit there. There are some species of horse, there's a good handful of it hiding out there, some species of horsetails which are evergreen throughout the winter. So there's lots of color down th there all winter long. And in the eternal cycle of nature, lichens, mosses and grasses would have been food for some of the first animals to arrive here after the retreat of the glaciers. That food held energy captured from the sun during photosynthesis, energy that passed into the grazing animals. Back and forth the energy flows through the cycles of eating and being eaten. This food chain is not so much a length of chain as a necklace. For more information visit our website on topoftheworld.net.